So as Steve said, this is uh, my first, present first large presentation, and my watch has definitely told me as well because it's told me I have a high heart rate. <laughs> um, so you can find me on the usual places on GitHub and on Twitter. Uh, I've, uh, I've had an interesting kind of career over uh, since I w came out of uni quite a while ago now. I started with web, um, and so I worked a lot with, uh, on back-end systems with PHP and Rails. And um, then eventually I got my first iPhone. And so my nights and evenings and weekends and things like that were kind of hacking together projects, figuring out Objective-C, not really knowing what I was doing with memory management, but I slowly kind of got there. I got a few, a few apps in the store, and then I got very lucky, and um, I was able to join uh, a small company that kind of did uh, iOS training and a few apps of their own, and so I kind of, uh, I, I got to learn really uh, the right way to do iOS development, or at least at the time, the right way to do it. Uh, and then I got a very lucky break, and I moved to my first big company uh, at the BBC, and I got to work on some interesting stuff, uh, BBC uh, iPlayer Radio first, and uh, that was quite a large Objective-C code base. First time that like I had an app that was going out to millions of people, so that was really exciting. And um, most recently on BBC Sounds, and Sounds was uh, the great rewrite, and so we got a good chance to do uh, Swift, uh, Swift first project, and um, got to learn a lot of new things, and had a, I had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, most recently I've joined uh, Monzo, so I'm helping to build a bank now. And yeah, but today uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, BBC Sounds. So BBC Sounds makes really uh, heavy, heavy use of collection views. We've got the dial, um, which is a uh, infinitely scrolling uh, list of uh, content, so it's the radio stations. Um, you can see there's another one on here, which is at the bottom, which is a horizontal uh, collection view as well. Uh, we've got this other custom collection view, which is a three by N uh, grid of uh, episodes, and there's actually another one down in the corner that's very similar to the hot podcasts. Uh, so you can see that we're heavily, heavily make use of collection views. Uh, in fact, it's collection views of collection views. Uh, so we have collection views all the way down. <laughs> um, but we're here to talk about the dial today. And um, what we're going to cover is, oh, sorry, let's get past that. Okay, uh, uh, there's a video coming up of, that, uh, of this as well, but uh, this, we're going to speak about this dial, and uh, what this is, is this is an, um, an infinitely kind of scrolling list of content, so it just loops back on each other. Uh, you can see that we've got the, uh, the design behavior where cells peak, so that you can kind of give that hint to the user that there's more content available. And um, this is all done with a UI collection view, uh, a custom layout. So we're going to cover uh, a little bit, a um, little bit about like what uh, collection view is. So not really going right to basics, but just a quick recap. Um, we're going to talk about your layout options when you uh, consider a collection view. Uh, so whether you want to, there's a couple built-in ways of doing this, or there's completely custom as well. Um, then we're going to actually build that example, uh, that real that dial, in uh, the 40 minutes we have here, and we're going to talk uh, talk a little bit about kind of uh, the accessibility concerns that we have with uh, building that dial. I'd recommend uh, for all the Android people in in here, uh, Polly's uh, uh, an excellent speaker, and she's going to be speaking about the Android version of this talk and how the dial was built. Uh, from an Android point of view, so I, I think it's called Recycler Views in Android. Uh, so don't miss that tomorrow. Um, so let's just talk about the basics. So uh, we can kind of think of this actually in terms of a table view, uh, uh, because I, I find that when I was teaching iOS that most people had encountered table views, but maybe not necessarily collection views, although these days you tend to, you tend to hit them a little bit sooner. Uh, but a collection view has a data uh, source, a delegate, uh, you're displaying cells on the screen, and uh, there's headers and footers. And so we can look at the contacts app and we can kind of see how these pieces kind of fit together. 
Collection view is very much the same, but it introduces one more piece of information or one more kind of uh, class to this uh, particular structure. And uh, that's the UI collection view layout. And that's an abstract base class. Uh, and what that means is that you are really going to be providing an implementation of that. And uh, as an example, here's BBC Sound. So you can see that we've got actually two collection views here. So you can get quite varied diff uh, quite different layouts depending on what you plug into that, uh, that piece of the puzzle there. Um, what your layout is going to be doing is it's going to be producing UI collection view layout attributes. And these attributes are what describe where the cell is on the screen. Uh, it's got a few other characteristics about um, uh, kind of like if the cell has been transformed, uh, but mainly, it's about where it appears on the screen. And these attributes are, are made by the layout and then uh, passed back to the UI collection view at appropriate times when the API calls on you. So these layout attributes are made up of uh, the frame, so it, where it is on that, in that collection view, index path, and then a transform property, which we'll get into a little bit later, uh, alpha Z index and is hidden so you can do clever things. You can have cells on top of cells. This isn't table view where we're just kind of listing a, a column of, uh, of uh, data. You can get quite, in, quite uh, inventive with your layouts. But we'll get back to these a little bit later. Uh, if you still want to check out the basics, like the absolute basics of collection view, uh, there's a uh, WWC video from 2018 uh, tour of UI collection view. Um, look for the what's new in UI kit or, or collection view that appears most years. So most recently, uh, drag and drop support was added. Um, and then also there's a really good resource on the developer portal, which is the collection view programming guide for iOS. And that brings you all the way from uh, the very basics of getting cells and, and interfacing uh, with the data source and everything and all the way up to building a custom layout as well. Uh, I have links for all these uh, at the end uh, on uh, the uh, project link to the on GitHub. So don't worry about writing all this down. You'll get it a little bit later. Um, so let's talk about the choices with layout. Uh, we've we said that uh, UI collection view uh, layout is actually that abstract base class, and what that means is it implements a few things for you, but you really need to provide uh, a concrete implementation to UI collection view to to get these layouts. And Apple ships one of, a, one of them for us, and that's UI Collection View Flow Layout. And, um, and Flow Layout is quite useful on its own. It can do a lot of things. It's generally for linear content. Uh, you can extend it yourself as well, so you can take everything that Flow Layout gives you and even uh, adjust those layout attributes after it's done all those calculations. Or, depending on what your, uh, what your design looks like, you can go completely custom. And in terms of kind of ease of use, as well as how much responsibility you're taking on, uh, the flow layout with a delegate or flow layout on its own is pretty easy to use right out of the box. You can generally get something on the screen, uh, but it may not f look necessarily exactly like you want. You can uh, subclass it and it make some adjustments to those cells, or you can, again, do the full custom layout, but that you are taking on a lot of responsibility. So uh, a flow layout is generally a, if you can look at your data or if you can look at the design and you can think of it out as a grid of uh, vertical uh, flowing content or a grid of kind of horizontal content, flow layout is probably the thing that you want. Um, it's still pretty powerful. You can still get really far with this. Apple recommends that this is really the first place that you should be looking. Uh, I mean, you can look at fo the Photos app and, again, BBC Sounds. Uh, so this is our search for uh, most popular search term, Archers. Uh, and that uh, is a horizontal collection view, and that's just created with flow layout, so it's quite, uh, it's quite flexible. Um, over here, we've got uh, the Photos app, and this is just a vertical uh, list of content. So you can see the cells start uh, from the left-hand side over to the right, and then they'll flow kind of down to the next row and over. It looks pretty much like the content is rigid here and that all the cells are the same size, 
well, there's nothing, nothing that's making, uh, or there's nothing in the API contract that says like all the cells must be the same size. You can be dynamic here. It'll flow that content all the way down, depending on the size of the cells. Uh, now, a custom layout, uh, this is when you can't necessarily look at your data like a grid. Uh, it isn't necessarily representable linearly, um, or you kind of, uh, your data just doesn't really fit exactly with what uh, Flow Layout offers out of the box. Um, from that WWDC video, they go through building a photo mosaic, and you can see here that the, there still is like a timeline. There's er earlier photos and later photos down below, but you can see there isn't uh, necessarily uh, which order, like everything doesn't kind of uh, just go in nice uh, columns and rows here. So this is written as a custom layout, and that's from the WWC video, so you can watch that if you'd like to really dig into detail on how they've done that. <coughs> um, the Clocks app is a, also a custom collection view, and I know what you're looking at. You're looking here, and you're going, that looks pretty boring, and that looks like a horizontal collection view. But up here, these, there's actually two collection views on the screen. Uh, there's the clocks at the bottom and the map at the top, and the cells are the cities here. They're, so they're all running off the same data source, but you can see you can really get quite varied results depending on what you want to do. So the position of the cells on the screen, uh, it's mapping based on GPS data, or well, GPS coordinates onto a, uh, onto a map. In the terms of UI collection view, that would be a decoration view. Um, and now let's look at the, ah, oh good, the video's worked. <laughs> let's look at the uh, dial in BBC Sounds. So there's actually quite a lot going on here, and you can see the cell peaking behavior. Uh, you can see that it's scrolling and snapping into place. That content's looping around so the user can never get to the end of it, whether they go left or right. Uh, there's haptics, although I can't demo that right here. Uh, but we had lots of fun building this one, and so we're going to build a very simple version of this, and I'm hoping that'll help you build custom layouts in your own apps. Just before we get to that, though, we want to kind of go back a little bit in time to iPlayer Radio, and because uh, we have something very, very similar uh, down at the bottom there. So we have the, the dial. And this is actually why the dial ended up in uh, sounds. We wanted to make our users that were familiar with the... Um, with iPlayer Radio kind of feel familiar as they're coming to the app. So it didn't look like it was out of, they didn't look like they were just coming into something brand new. So it was really important, the UX really wanted us to have this dial. And they, uh, we thought we could potentially reuse this. But uh, what we've actually did was, uh, and this might uh, relate to the previous talks, but we actually hadn't really handled accessibility on iOS so well with this dial. So this entire dial here uh, is uh, completely uh, unavailable to a voiceover user. Uh, the only way that the voiceover users can navigate is that you can see there's kind of another collection of data up here, although not a collection view, and they can three finger swipe across it. So moving just to take that dial would mean us trying to add accessibility after the fact, and I think we all have learned that that's really not the way that we should be thinking about accessibility. Um, I also spent an entire day trying to get haptics into this particular uh, dial so that as you transition, you'd get a little bit of feedback on your device. Um, it was a, it's a 3,000 line uh, uh, view that has in one file uh, that everyone was terrified of touching. And so we thought this might be a good opportunity to rewrite. And plus it wasn't in Swift, so it was a good excuse. So you might look at this and you might think, well, that actually does look linear, and that could be flow layout. Um, but there's a couple different reasons that we really weren't able to make that work. Uh, they can scroll forever, and out of the box, uh, UI collection view is, uh, has an end, a start and an end. Uh, and especially flow layout, the, the content it has a start and the end. And so, uh, we also wanted to handle the case where there was less data, so we had this situation where you could scroll all the way through it, but we also wanted to be robust if the API gave us back uh, less stations than we were expecting for some odd reason, and also get a little bit of reuse out of this. We thought we'd use this in a different part of the app as well. 
So we wanted a layout that could do all of these things, and that meant going into a custom layout. <coughs> um, so we're going to build this. And in scope for today, uh, we've got four things we're going to do. So we're going to build, uh, and we're going to get some basic cells on the screen. Uh, we're going to make the collection view loop, and then we're going to adjust and create a dial effect, and then we're going to handle uh, accessibility correctly here. So when a, when a voiceover user is using uh, the app, it isn't a poor experience, or the, they are still able to get access to all that content. So we've got a lot of steps to cover, so let's get going. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to subclass UI Collection View Layout. Uh, the API contract is really uh, three things. We're going to call. We're going to get called with prepare, which is UI Collection View's way of telling us get your data ready. Uh, then we're going to get uh, called back with how how big the layout is. So UI Collection View needs to know how much room there is to scroll. And then it's going to start asking for these layout attributes to apply to the cells. Now, don't worry about writing everything down. Everything's on GitHub. Um, I've got a link at the end. All the projects, uh, the entire project's there. All the steps are in different branches. So there's five steps. Uh, so don't worry too much if I go through the code slides uh, a little too quickly. Um, so the first thing we want to do is we want to actually get back to flow. Because by default, there's nothing on screen with this collection view uh, if, uh, as we've subclassed it. Um, it's not difficult, but the main thing we want to do is we want to just keep organized. With custom layouts, you need to have the answers for collection view when you're called on. And keeping good bookkeeping just makes that actually really easy. So let's set up some good bookkeeping. So we're going to keep track of how many items we have, uh, the item sizes, how much spacing there is, how much all the items and the, and the spacings, uh, or how much an item and all of its uh, spacing would take. And then the content width is just how many items we have multiplied by that. So that's quite easy. You can see actually how all these are quite static for our uh, demonstration purposes, but you, can, you could easily make these driven off of a delegate or uh, dynamically so that they could be adjusted and you could get more reuse out of your uh, custom layout. Now, finally, we're going to store the layout attributes as well. Now, um, layout attributes are not the views. They're fairly lightweight. They're just plain old ordinary NS objects. And uh, they just store that, those kind of frames that we were talking about. Um, always keep in mind that uh, when you're going to create these layout attributes and prepare, if you're Kind of having, if your intention is to have thousands and thousands of uh, pieces of content or cells on the screen, uh, your this approach may not necessarily work for you because we're calculating everything up front. Uh, it will work probably reasonably well for uh, hundreds of cells, but when you get into the thousands of cells, you might have to s delay kind of calculation of all these uh, attributes. As always, just measure in instruments and figure out what works for you. So. This is the prepare method, and we can see that what we're actually really doing is going out to our data source. So this is the other side of the call that we always get. So we're going to ask the collection view for the numbers of items in a particular section, and that's going to go to its data source, and we're going to get that, and we're going to store that off. Uh, then we're going to go through for the number of items and create layout attributes for them. And all this is doing here is this is just tiling them along. So we're just going to get a horizontal uh, kind of uh, line of collection view cells. So that's really all we have to do and prepare for now. Uh, next thing that uh, collection view is going to ask us about is how big, how much content is there actually going to be on screen? And again, because of our organization, this is really easy to answer because we already have the content width, which is that calculated property. And uh, the height of it is just the frame, uh, the frame's height. So however big the collection view is on the screen is how big our collection view layout is going to be. The next uh, two parts uh, of the API is uh, these two methods, which is layout attributes for elements in rect and layout attributes uh, for item at index path. Um, the elements in rect is the call that you'll likely see first or often. Uh, you'll, the other one is called when you uh, invalidate part of a data source. So like if you 
supported deleting one cell or adding a cell or adding uh, content after uh, after a layout has been done. Uh, iOS or UIKit may ask you for that, uh, those particular attributes in kind of being more optimal so that it doesn't have to ask for the entire layout attributes again. Uh, be careful with the layout attributes for elements in Erect. Uh, what's happening there is uh, Collection View will ask you for all the particular attributes that are in that particular frame, but that frame isn't necessarily what's uh, the visible content area. Uh, in my experience, f uh, for smaller collection views, it'll actually ask for the entire uh, uh, frame of the collection view or s the entire bounds. Uh, so you'll, you may find that it, uh, if you're trying to drive off of the visible rect uh, and figure out what's there, that's not, that's not the same thing. So just keep those in mind. So these two methods, again, are actually really easy to implement because we take our layout attributes and we just see which frames intersect and we're gonna return those. And if we're asked for a specific one, we just go and find it in our uh, cache, in our layout attributes. So with less than 60 lines of code, uh, we've actually reproduced flow layout, a very simple flow layout, but uh, not that bad for little, for very little amount of code. Um, but we need to do better than this. We need to do looping now. And, uh, and we want our content to repeat. Um, so when I was doing this, I kind of thought uh, I, I could just return different layout attributes from that rect, or from that, uh, every time I was asked, I could just return. And as it scrolls over, I'll just return different ones. And then as it scrolls over a bit further, I'll just adjust them and return different ones again. Um, but this breaks the API contract. And also, uh, uh, I didn't realize at the time that that layout, at, uh, the rec that you're being asked for isn't necessarily uh, matching the visible rec either. Uh, there's also lots of other reasons why that rec doesn't match, which is like, uh, for example, cell prefetching and uh, small collection views, as I mentioned. So uh, this was out, and this didn't really work. Um, but what we could do, and after a little bit of experimentation was, if we just give the user some room to scroll on either side, um, and then we were able to change those layout attributes every time the user scrolled, then what we could do is we could just shuffle those cells kind of in front of them or behind them as they kind of scrolled. And uh, so every time the user changes, or every time they scroll, uh, what happens is it's called a bounds change. So the collection view is really showing a small window into the entire content area. And so what we really want to do is something like this. I'm going to do this in two steps. The user scrolls, and so the content goes off to the side. But at the same time, we're going to invalidate all our layer attributes. <coughs> we're going to calculate where they would be in this particular case. and we're gonna then return those layout attributes when the collection view asks uh, where they are. And so we're just kind of just in time putting these cells in the right place. Uh, well, just in time cells. Um, so let's see how to do that. So we're gonna give ourselves a little bit of room on the left and the right hand side and then because we're all about bookkeeping and everything, we wanna make sure that we keep where the edges are. So this leading offset X and this uh, trailing offset X. And we're gonna use those later so that we can uh, kind of shift back. But for now, uh, this should be enough to give us kind of some room to scroll. And then because we've uh, recorded the, uh, the insets, the, uh, we have to then mention or we then have to say how big the collection view content size is. So we're going to adjust the width by just having uh, double the inset, so the left and the right, or the leading and the trailing side. So we've given ourselves some room, and now we need to change these layout attributes every time the user scrolls. And it turns out there's actually a nice callback for that. So um, all we have to do is return true from this, and uh, what we're going to be, every time the user scrolls, the layout will be in invalidated, we'll get prepare called again, we can find out where we are, and we can shift those layout attributes. So that's actually really, really simple. 
Um, now, we want to make sure, now that we've got this larger collection, uh, this larger collection view, and our content is right in the middle, we want to uh, drop that user right, kind of right at the start of that content. Otherwise, we're gonna leave them on the left-hand side, and there's gonna be, uh, there's, there's gonna be no, con well, there's gonna be content, but they're gonna be up against kind of one edge of it already. So, we'll drop them right in the middle, and uh, don't worry too much about this method, it just keeps track of where the first bit, of, or it just puts them to the first bit of content and then keeps track that they, that we have done that. And then what we'll do is we're gonna change prepare. So we're gonna cache our previous layout attributes because those are really, that's the line, like the line of cells that we have. And that's good data. We know where, we know that that's where the cells are always gonna be, but we just need to shift them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find out as the user scrolls, how far along are they in the content, basically how many multiples of the content are they uh, along, which index would be the first one, which cell would be the first cell. And then we're going to make new layout attributes by just copying the old layout attributes and using uh, this shift function, uh, which is really just swapping an array around. So for example, if we were gonna be on the third cell, then what we'll do is we're gonna take out a, a copy of all of our layout attributes. We're gonna take the first three cells and shift those to the end. And that's our new layout, uh, that's our new adjusted layout attributes. Uh, we haven't adjusted them yet, but they're in the right order. The next thing we need to do is we need to start drawing those cells or st well, start providing the frames for those cells so that they can be drawn on the screen in the right place. So this is quite easy. Uh, we're just gonna go through each adjusted uh, layered attribute and we're gonna start from where they would be, the current X, and we're just gonna draw those cells. So really what we've done is we've just implemented that portion where those cells are there as the user scrolls. Now, I kind of glossed over this initially with, uh, 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 there was a small problem at the start where we were asking how many cells there was uh, to our data source and then caching those results. And anytime we have caching, we always know in computer science we have a hard problem, cache invalidation. Uh, but luckily the framework comes to the rescue again and we, had, we can provide uh, a hook into the invalidate layout and if we're invalidating the data source or if we're invalidating everything, we can just throw away our uh, cache layout attributes and recalculate. And you can see this is the other side of the, has set the initial content offset. So has the user been brought to the middle? So we throw away all that data and, uh, and this, fixes the, uh, this fixes the problem with uh, if the data counts changed or the data source changed and uh, someone outside called reload data. So what we end up with is pretty good result actually. It is looping back and forth, or sorry, it is repeating its content but we hit a wall still. We haven't really solved it completely. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, the first uh, fix I did to this was just make the collection view bounds uh, something like 100,000 <laughs> points uh, and just thought, well, the user probably won't get to the end of that. But there is a better way. Uh, the more and more I read the docs, the more I realized that there's always seems to be a hook uh, into what we need or a way of doing it. Uh, so we need these cliff edges. We need these places where the user is going to scroll over the uh, uh, far enough along that they are going to get off the end and we need to kind of transparently shuffle them back. And in that invalidation context, um, uh, we can actually provide a content offset adjustment. And so when the collection view is told that the layout has completely invalidated, what it'll do is it will take that uh, invalidation context and apply that offset. So if, if we tell it to make the ad offset adjustment by a thousand or minus a thousand, then what it'll do is it'll, it, as, as it invalidates, it'll jump all the way back to a thousand and then start asking for the content at that particular location. So this is all transparent to the user and we have a nice hook uh, so that we can make an adjustment to that uh, context 
by implementing this part in our layout, invalidation context for bounds change. So this is exactly what we want, because we're invalidating on every bounds change. And what we're going to get is we're going to get this situation where the user will run up against a cliff edge, and we're really just going to shift them all the way over. And before the next time we draw anything on screen, Collection View will start asking for the cells at that particular location, and it'll just work. And this is transparent. This is will maintain all the scroll momentum. Uh, this will work if they're holding their finger across. It doesn't count, cancel the touch or anything. And it's actually not even that difficult to implement. So we're going to check where we are in the collection view, the content offset. And if we're going to hit one of these cliffs, either the end, the trailing side, or the uh, leading side, then what we're going to do is we're just going to shift them back by the entire content width. So we're just kind of like moving them back and forth. But to the user, they just have no idea. In fact, it looks really smooth. If you watch, I've left the scroll indicator on. And you can see that it's just jumping back. But if you watch the cells, you can't tell. It, you can't tell where that happens at all. It's seamless. It doesn't cancel the touch. It just works. So now we get to do something fun. Uh, so on those uh, layout attributes, uh, there's two properties there, transform, 3D, and transform. Uh, if you set one, the other one is changed. And if you, same vice versa. The new one is transform 3D. Uh, so these transforms are uh, what gets applied to the cell when you uh, when the cell is going to be shown on screen. So we'll, we're going to provide these layout attributes. Collection view is going to go and fetch that cell from the data source, and then what it'll do is it'll apply those layout attributes. And what we can do is for every uh, layout attribute after we made the adjustment for kind of putting them in order. We can actually do a little bit of maths here. And the maths is really not the important bit. But we can do an adjustment to them, to each of these cells. So this is, in a, this is actually in a loop. And what we're doing is we're finding out what's visible on screen. And we're making a Y translation. And so this line of cells here, what we're doing is the further it goes off the screen, the further we're making it follow uh, the circumference of a circle. So this is called uh, chord theorem. And um, I think me and Polly ended up spending probably a day and a half kind of re-deriving chord theorem, and eventually found it on a wiki, uh, Wikipedia article. Uh, but it's at, all this is doing is just finding out, as you go further away from the center, how, where are you on this arc of the circle? So you can see how this could apply to any of your layouts. You, could, you can do all sorts of stuff with transforms. They're just a standard uh, translation, scale, or rotation. So you could get really clever. In fact, the dial does a bit of a scale up as well. So you kind of get that center dial, uh, center cell more in focus. And that looks a little bit like this. So we've kind of reproduced the dial. I mean, it's not as pretty, but it's, it's close. Uh, you could probably get to this far in another afternoon. At the most, uh, maybe a nicer debug cell would get you probably most of the way there. Um, but it's actually not, not the one that uh, is in BBC Sounds isn't much more complex. The only thing that uh, BBC Sounds does that I haven't demoed here is that peaking behavior. But there's nice hooks, as you'd expect, uh, into uh, where the content offset will settle, and, your, and there's hooks into where to make those adjustments. If you're interested in that, I can. I can go through that after. Uh, but for now, we want to make sure that we're kind of, we've built a really good, robust collection view. And to do that, we want to make sure that our accessibility is, is as good as it can be. Um, so with, uh, with uh, custom layouts, you're, um, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. With custom layouts, you're, you can, you generally find that you're mostly on your own in terms of the order that VoiceOver will do, uh, kind of visit the, the views on screen. Um, in my experience, it generally goes left to right, top to bottom, but like maybe sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, if you're using Flow Layout, there's, uh, they've definitely written it so that it follows the index paths and does the right thing. But if you're doing anything with custom layouts, just keep in mind that you're taking on a lot of responsibility here to get this right. Um, 
we also knew that the dial would be a trap uh, in accessibility terms, and a trap means the user could get to it and then would just continually be scrolling through it and wouldn't realize that there's more content or a way to get out away from it. Um, so what, uh, what we found, or what uh, through experimentation, the best way that we discovered to do this was actually not treat it like a bunch of separate content, but treat it more like a control. So think of it as like a UI picker, like a date selector, or uh, a UI slider. And those kind of con you, uh, controls in UIKit, they have um, this trait called UI accessibility trait adjustable. And that would allow the user to kind of page through with an up and down gesture uh, through the content rather than having to visit every cell and to get to the next uh, piece of content. So what we need to do to make sure we get this right uh, in, in our uh, collection view layout is we need to make sure that when the accessibility is on, we fall back to a non-looping layout, so either flow or a custom layout that isn't uh, looping. We need to put a, another view over top that kind of captures those accessibility gestures or captures the uh, the uh, voiceover uh, accessibility focus. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to forward those uh, uh, accessibility increment and decrement methods over to our view controller. And um, I'm going to show you one just uh, because the other one is almost identical. So if we, uh, if we get the accessibility increment uh, gesture, then what's going to happen is we're just going to find out where we are in this layout, and then we're going to add one to it and make sure we didn't fall off the end. And then we're going to ask the collection view, uh, sorry, we're going to uh, change our label so that it's showing a different, uh, or so that it will read a different bit of content. And then we're going to ask the collection view to scroll to that new index. And this actually happens, anim uh, and it's animated at the same time. So it's still a nice experience. It's still easy to get through. But also, uh, the user doesn't have to go through 20 radio stations to get to the next thing either. They can just get to it and skip right over that content if they need to. The other thing that we need to remember to do here is listen in in our layout for these two particular uh, notifications. So when voice server goes on or off, or when switch control goes on or off, we want to do the right thing, revert to kind of a flow layout. Uh, make sure that uh, we've uh, turned off any of that looping, and, uh, and then the user should be able to navigate through that content uh, using voiceover or switch control. And here we go with a demo. So... Voiceover on, loop layout, loop layout, portrait, activates the cell, button, heading, adjustable, cell, one, cell, two, cell, three, more app content accessible to voiceover users. So you saw as the user is going through those cells and it's saying cell one, cell two, cell three, they're making the accessibility gestures up, like the increment up and down. Uh, I realize a lot of people may not be that comfortable with voiceover, um, but I really encourage you to go and actually get the fundamentals down, learn how some of those controls work with voiceover on, because then you can kind of mimic them or behave like them as well, and then uh, you'll end up with a better experience for your voiceover users. So I guess we're just wrapping up now, um, but keep in mind that if you're going to do a custom layout, uh, you're responsible for a lot. You have to make sure that you're, um, you're responsible for everything that appears on the screen, but it's actually not overly difficult. Uh, the framework provides excellent hooks. Take a deep dive deep dive through the documentation. There's all sorts of interesting things in there that I haven't even gotten to. Uh, and don't forget about accessibility. It should be awesome for everyone. Um, Collection View does way, 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 way more as well. So there's, uh, you can get into custom layout attributes, and we made use of that a little bit in BBC Sounds. So this is where you can pass something all the way from your layout all the way to the cell. So uh, we use this for uh, letting the cell know when it was the last item in a section so that it could draw an extra line on the bottom, for example. Uh, you can also do custom invalidation contexts. So if you find that your layout is quite complex uh, to calculate and you don't want to throw all of it away when it, one, one of the cells is removed or if the data slightly changes, 
you can write your own invalidation context here, your own properties, and only invalidate part of your layout. So it's really quite powerful. Uh, collection View has been around since uh, iOS 6. Uh, there's all the new drag and drop stuff in there as well. Uh, there's tons and tons of stuff to look at, so I'd really recommend uh, diving into it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>